welcome to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. It's been a wonderful week. This week is episode 36. My guest is Jonathan Hildner for Texas House District 54. I'm joined by co-host Lauren Simpson. How's everybody doing? Hey, Great. Good, good. Billy Squire. Nice touch. I like it. <laughs> That's a great intro video. If that doesn't get anybody excited, I don't know what else. Well, I thank you for that because I literally just made that intro video yesterday. <laughs> like I, we had this record that spun and I was like, I, I want something different, something that's more Texas and yeah. slapped all this stock footage together of Houston, Dallas, San Antonio and Austin. And I thank you for that. I appreciate that the hard work meant something. For sure. Yeah. You're running for House District 54. What all what all this House District 54 cover? I am. Um, House District 54 is now uh, thankfully in one county. Uh, it encompasses the uh, majority of the city of Killeen, um, the full city of Salado, um, all of eastern Bell County, uh, so our rural communities um, here in Bell County. Uh, it's uh, jokingly referred to as the donut district in the state. Uh, because they uh, were able to draw it perfectly in a donut with another district within it. Which which district is within? It's like it's like Fort Hood is within side of that because I heard that was no. So actually, Fort Hood. So Fort Hood is actually in fifty four. It's in my district. Uh, what's inside of it is Parker Heights, Noblesville, Belton, and Temple. Um, so it's literally um, a donut. I actually there it is right there, perfectly on the outside, and then there's an, a district on the inside as well. Interesting. And yeah, are, 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 there's people challenging the legality of that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've been reached out to uh, by, uh, I want to say, uh, DOJ is investigating um, not only for the, uh, the state lines, but also the congressional lines. Um, another funky line was drawn uh, for the city of Killeen as well. I think a concern I, I heard online was that when you have districts set up like that, it concerns people that the maintenance for things like the roads could become an issue for getting to the district, like access to one district is now being governed by another district. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's a mess. Um, you know, uh, we can get into the, the logic of, of why the districts would be drawn, um, how they are on a congressional level and on the state house level, but um, I'll save everybody's time uh, now, but it, it definitely is being challenged and, um, you know, uh, let, let, let's hope that uh, we get it figured out and uh, we can, run some legit races out here. So I want to want to start off asking what, what your background is. Um, where you do, did you do advocacy work? Was there government work you were involved with before? You want me to start from the very beginning or do you want me to start? From let's the let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. We'll do it chronologically yeah. instead of like a Tarantino movie. Yeah, it's usually easier to do it that way. Um, so uh, I'm one of the unique uh, folks here in the clean area. I was born here at Darnell Hospital. Um, 1993 to a uh, army captain um, at the time. Uh, moved around a little bit, but Colleen was always home. Uh, we came back three times uh, throughout my youth. Um, I ended up graduating here uh, from Colleen High School. Um, so I'm a KISD grad. Uh, during that time, my father uh, deployed multiple times. His last de deployment was in Afghanistan, and unfortunately, he passed away. Um, in February of 2012, so the second semester of my senior year of high school. Um, so I do also have the unique um, identity to be part of a, a phenomenal, uh, but obviously uh, tough group called the Gold Star Family. Um, so I'm a Gold Star child. Uh, I then uh, bounced around uh, trying to figure things out. Uh, man of the house uh, landed in uh, a great school called Limestone College, now at Limestone University. Um, graduated from there. 2018. Uh, during my tenure at Limestone um, is when I really began my uh, political work. I worked on a, a Senate race uh, challenging, it was Trey Gowdy's seat, um, which is now uh, held by Tim Scott. Uh, so I worked throughout the Democratic primary there in South Carolina, learned a lot, loved it, graduated, uh, moved to Washington, D.C., um, got a job working for Congresswoman Kathleen Clark from Massachusetts who at the time was the vice chair of the Democratic Caucus um, and is now the assistant speaker of the House. Uh, worked there for about eight months. Uh, got the amazing opportunity to uh, go work on a presidential campaign early um, in 2019. Uh, I definitely had my pick of the litter. I think at the time we had 22 uh, 
Democrats in the primary. Um, I chose Joe Biden, um, went there or went to Iowa in 2019, um, then went to uh, Texas, Mississippi, Georgia, um, many other states, uh, ultimately ending in Georgia, where I became the youth vote director for the whole state of Georgia. So organizing voters um, from 18 to 35. Um, as we all know, uh, we won Georgia. Uh, Georgia had the largest youth vote turnout in the nation, um, something I'm definitely very proud of. And I uh, flipped the state blue. Um, so uh, that was a great experience. Uh, after the presidential election, I've got the opportunity to come back and work um, for Senator Ossoff and Warnock in their runoffs, um, which we won as well. Um, I then, uh, during the time of the presidential campaign, when COVID hit, uh, we all kind of dispersed from where we were working on the ground and uh, went home. I came back here to Colleen. Um, George Floyd, at that time, uh, about a month after I came home, George Floyd passed away. Um, I created a nonprofit organization here in the city called Let's Move Clean. Um, we kicked off with a rally outside of uh, one of our well-known establishments with um, upwards of three, 4,000 people showed up, um, different colors, backgrounds, um, experiences. And uh, I think we, uh, it's been said that we were able to keep our community together during some tumultuous times. Obviously, some more things happened after that. I would say my biggest uh, kind of honor during that time creating that was uh, we got No Not Warrants uh, banned here in the city of Colleen a few months after that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been an advocate outside and uh, it's not only in politics. Um, I'm super impressed with all the work you've done. I mean, I love someone that, you know, is, is starting programs, is, is boots on the ground. Um, I, I saw that Julie Oliver has endorsed, endorsed you, and she mm -hmm. uh, is with Ground Game Texas. They were up in Colleen, yes, doing a yep. petition drive to get um, decriminalization of marijuana on the ballot yeah. up there. Um, yeah, how so, was that experience? Oh, it, it's been, you know, Julie uh, is, is one of those uh, unicorns in, in our communities that uh, she's just such a phenomenal person and, and so passionate about people. Um, I got to work with Julie on the ground during her campaign in 2020 when I was home. Um, I lent the hand wherever I could because she had a weird little piece of Colleen um, and we figured out how to organize it. Um, very honored and, and blessed and, and uh, very humbled to have her endorsement uh, over the last few months, really since um, I want to say it was October of last year, we decided that we wanted to um, get a petition um, started to get the decriminalization of marijuana in the city of Colleen on the ballot. And so uh, we've been working over the last few months, uh, waiting for this municipal election next week uh, to be over so we can know exactly how many signatures um, we need. Uh, we think we've surpassed it uh, by a bunch of signatures at this point, but it's been a great experience. It's been great having her come and, and, and have her advocacy. It's been, it's been great seeing how you, unified the community is uh, for this issue. And so um, I'm excited to see uh, the petitions get turned in and then those petitions be on the ballot in November. How would you say with ground, with you, where you sit at with your campaign and things like ground game that cannabis relates to the greater Bell County area? Yeah, I mean, I think you can go a couple of different avenues with it. I think the main one um, that we all know Bell County for is veterans. Um, you know, we have the largest military institution uh, installation, I'm sorry, uh, in, in the country. Um, and that gives us a lot of veterans um, as they transition out of the military. And, um, you know, this isn't a, a, a true stat, but um, from my experiences, you know, eight to nine out of 10 uh, veterans that I'm speaking to um, have used or have uh, experimented with uh, marijuana in some sort to alleviate the pain um, to avoid uh, the opioids and psychotropics um, that are being prescribed through the VA. And so that's the main one. Um, criminal justice reform is huge for me as well uh, here in our community. And, uh, you know, the economic benefit that the legalization of marijuana would have in this community uh, would, would be an amazing effect as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised at how many people that are veterans, not just veterans, and this is, I went to high school in Harker Heights. 
And I remember when I was getting ready to join the Navy, everybody kept telling me, oh, dude, you don't have to worry about about drugs and drug tests. That's they say that, but you don't have to worry. And I was like, man, the, the MEPS guys and the recruiters are testing me nonstop. And they're right. like, dude, well, once you get in, man, someone will pee for you. And I was like, what are you talking about? Well, we're, we're so low on people. It's insane. And I was blown away by how many people I ran into in the greater clean area that were in service that were using. And then the one, and then when they get out, it was even heavier. And it was, yeah. they were like, yo, I, I, I just saw people get blown apart in the middle East. Yeah. This yeah. helps me sleep at night. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it, it, it's clear that, you know, we need better uh, pain management, particularly for our veterans. I mean, um, to live in a community like this, where we don't talk about mental health and PTSD as much as we do, uh, it's sort of that silent, it is a silent killer. And um, it's not something that we address enough. And, and the military has its resources. Um, but as a community, as the community that these veterans are choosing to uh, live the rest of their lives in, um, I think we need to support them. And, you know, the sad fact is, most of the veterans that I talk to um, smoke or you know, take, uh, you know, gummies or whatever their source of uh, getting THC is. Um, and then when they go speak to their counselor at the VA, um, they're saying that they're not uh, because they don't want to lose their their disability benefits. And and that's just a dangerous uh, line to walk in and we, we need to advocate for them. Well, uh, can I say I'm a daughter of a captain as well. And thank you for your service. Um, thank you. My dad was a captain in the Army. And uh, I think... Uh, Another point um, of, as, as a child that's not really discussed, though, I think to me, too, is the generational trauma that happens with, you know, my dad was in Vietnam and Sawson did some stuff that, you know, um, mostly he wouldn't tell me about. And I never yeah. asked. And it's not my place to question. Right. right. Um, but, you know, I just wonder, like, if my dad would have had access to cannabis. How different would his life been, my mom's life been, my life been, my husband's life been? Because he's got to right. deal with, you know, the, the trauma that I went through of having a dad with severe PTSD. And, you know, right. like, um, I just think that's another point um, that could definitely be discussed more, too, is yeah. protecting the veteran and the families. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, unique, the uniqueness in my candidacy is, um, I'm not running as a veteran. I'm running as uh, a family member. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was lucky that, you know, my father didn't show signs of PTSD uh, while I was growing up. I think he was really, uh, really good at containing it. Um, I don't know the best way to explain that, but um, he just didn't show it. And so, but from friends and family and relationships that I've had throughout my life, I mean, I've I, I can't tell you the, the amount of times on July 4th that I've seen the the, the reactions of, of veterans when fireworks go off. Um, I had a, uh, a friend at uh, one time that I was celebrating July 4th with uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, her dad jumped under the table, um, you know, and, and was crying. And, and you know, it, it, there, it, PTSD is severe um, and we need to address it. Um, there's not one way to address it. I think every situation is unique. Um, and if marijuana works, for individuals, then let's let them have the access to it uh, because they, they, they gave us their ultimate sacrifice. We've seen uh, things that we can never imagine and uh, people need to be able to deal with things, how they, how they find it suitable. I like how I was talking to one of my son when I was having to see a psychiatrist for a while and his autism, we were brought up about how this, it's not that people should do it and use it but that the doctor should have it as an option in the formulary for themselves if they think that's the option that should be used. Right. Yeah. No, I, I you know, I, one thing I need to be clear with um, as a Democrat that's running is I'm not advocating for the use of, of children um, using marijuana um, freely in the legalization of marijuana. Uh, what I think, you know, the most important thing uh, that we do is, you know, we legalize and we regulate it. Um, just as they have done with cigarettes, just as they, they just as they have done with alcohol. Um, it's extremely important that we keep uh, those things in mind. I mean, my opponent um, had mentioned in a in an article that uh, a cannabinoid uh, scientist said what the the scientist said. Moms and dads out there, tell your kids it's okay to smoke marijuana, but just wait until you're 25. And so, if that's the case, then let's legalize marijuana at 25 and go from there. I I can I can totally go with that point. 
Uh, it is time that we actually take a sponsor break here at the Lone Star Collective Podcast. So this is episode 36. I'm joined by guest Jonathan Hildner. Texas House District 54 is what he's running for here in the state of Texas. I'm joined by co-host Lauren Simpson. We'll be right back after these sponsor messages. Thrive Apothecary offers an experience truly unique from anything else in Texas. A full-service cannabis solution that is doctor-owned and offers customers every level of cannabis legally available in Texas. From traditional CBD products to emerging hemp-derived THC edibles, smokables, and now medical cannabis. As a licensed medical cannabis provider, prospective patients from anywhere in Texas can book a sponsored online eligibility consultation to determine if they qualify for a medical marijuana prescription from the comfort of their own home. Plus, for Texas veterans, the first prescription appointment is donated by Thrive. Visit thrivetx.com for more information. Oakcliff Cultivators is a sponsor of Texas Cannabis Collective and Lone Star Collective Podcast. Oakcliff focuses on quality assurance with their hemp products while providing customer service to help you discover cannabinoids to meet your needs. Their product line includes hemp flower pre-rolls, CPG tinctures, edibles, Delta 8, and merch. For more information on their products, quality, or to shop online today, visit oakcliffcultivators.com or contact them at info at oakcliffcultivators.com. Austinite Cannabis Company is an Austin, Texas, locally owned and family operated producer and seller of handcrafted cannabis products such as CBD, CBG, CBN, and Delta 8 made from hemp in Austin, Texas. Their selection of products includes beauty products, concentrates, edibles, merch, pet supplies, pre-rolls, tinctures, topicals, and accessories. For more information, visit austinitecannabis.co or you can visit their storefront location at 2009 East Cesar Chavez Street in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast, distributed on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, and much more, to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. Here is this week's host, Jesse Williams and Austin Sam Hariri. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode 36. We are joined by Jonathan Hildner, who's running for Texas House District 54. It has been a wonderful time having him so far on the show for our first segment. My co-host this week is actually Lauren Simpson. Our little outro bit says it's Austin Zam Hurry, but he is not in this week. So Lauren is filling in for him, and I think she's doing a wonderful job. How is everybody doing? She's doing a great job, by the way. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> it's fun. Well, I, I told her to get, I, I told her, I was like, don't worry. Like, you'll be fine. You're going to be okay with this. It's her first time, and she's doing wonderful. Oh, wow. yeah. The, heavy le- the host does the heavy lifting. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> and, and I, I, I told you do. I told you what you had to do for show prep, and you, I imagine you you had some questions. So let, let's lead off with a, with another question you might have, Lauren. Um. Well, kind of a hotly contested um, subject, I guess, is Delta Eight and that whole market. Um. What is your take on what's going on with that in Texas right now? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think um, when when I talk about you know, the, the advocacy for um, the full legalization. I mean, there's so much confusion um, in the Delta 8 field. Um, 
the from what I've learned, a lot of, of dealing with Delta Eight, I've just learned um, this year, um, and a lot of it, you know, sitting with people um, who are growers and distributors, talk about the difficulties of growing it and extracting it um, to get it to you know uh, that Delta Eight level and um, the loss of product when um, it's either too high or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, again, I think there, there's a lot of excuses that are made by politicians all over that say, you know, Texas just moves slow and, you know, um, we'll get there eventually, et cetera, et cetera. And I think these small little incremental pushes are just making it, you know, a lot more difficult for, for people to, one, get in the business um, and two, for the access of it. Uh, again, when we talk about, you know, uh, criminal justice reform and then we, you know, highlight minority um, the effects that it's had on minority communities. I mean, uh, Black Americans are still nearly four times as likely to be arrested for cannabis, um, although white and Black Americans use cannabis at uh, equivalent rates. Um, you know, the access for them, all, all the issues that uh, were talked about um, with people obtaining the licensing to uh, grow, um, it, it's, it's just been overly uh, confusing. Um, and I think that's on purpose. I would agree with you. <laughs> it's been a lack of inf- it has, it's not a disinformation campaign. It's, uh, it's not really a campaign. It's just a lack of information being handed down from our topper parts of our government to the, the our Leos on how like our even our hemp program works. We still have sheriffs and local law enforcement agencies going hemp. I, I never heard no hemp law. What are you talking about? And it's like we're we're three years into having this and they're going, I don't know what you're talking about. And it's, yeah, it's absurd. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, the, I, Delta eight has a flower. So, you know, the fact, you know, maybe somebody has Delta eight in their vehicle and that causes a whole nother, you know, they, they may be arrested. Uh, how are we testing, you know, are there field, are there field tests, um, you know, to make sure that somebody is, you know, legally able to um, have it or whatever it may be. I mean, I do know many people that love, uh, Delta Aid and, and are using it, um, but I do know others that say the Delta Aid isn't doing anything for them. When you bring up another, sorry, you bring up another topic about, you know, is do we want them to be able to field test it? Do we want to fund all right. of that so it just right. keeps driving the machine? Or, you know, like it's a yeah. sticky, sticky situation. And, and yeah, and, and and that's why we, you know, at least on the city level until, uh, and, and hopefully we're able to spread it throughout the county. I mean, we there's going back to the decrim petition. There's also mm-hmm. a petition in Harker Heights. Um, and so if we hope to spread it. If, if it's not going to happen at the state level or the federal level, mm-hmm. then we, we've got to take control of it on a local level. And, you know, in all reality, our, our police officers here in this community have much more important things to focus on than somebody that even if you have um, the illegal plant, um, if you have, you know, marijuana, um, you know, uh, anything less than two ounces. I mean, you're not distributing it. You're not trying to make money off of that. And so what, how can we reshift our focus on the criminal justice side? Um, but also to where we're not, um, uh, putting officers in that position, officers and civilians in that position when uh, they are pulled over or, you know, stopped or, you know, whatever it may be with, uh, either their legal product or their legal product on. Yeah. The, the thing that I've seen that's an issue with that is that like Lauren said, it's sticky because we want to be able to take irresponsible actors and hold them accountable for when they are irresponsible and they put others in harm's way. But until that happens, it's like, we don't want to be pushing something because then it's, it becomes a hammer looking for a nail. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you talk about, Again, when we talk kind of the confusion of all of this, I mean, how different does Delta 8 look from, uh, you know, marijuana itself, the bud, um, you know, all of these different things. And, and, and so, again, I'm just going to continue to emphasize. I know we, we're, we're talking about kind of where we're at, but I'm talking about where we're going, uh, not only as a country, but as a state. And, you know, uh, legalization means improved regulation, age limits, monitoring the strength of dosages, uh, determining when and where it's safe. Um, avoiding things like fentanyl lacing, um, avoiding the distribution from uh, the border coming in, 
you know, those types of things we, you know, we can, we can uh, politicize the whole conversation and, and there are so many more pros than there are um, cons in this situation. And, you know, I think it's, it, it takes the new generation, people like y'all advocating for y'all's generation, people from my generation, even younger, um, advocating for us to move forward and progress and protect people's lives. You're talking about the future. Um, how I'm going to go ahead and ask the big question. Um, in the future, do you see home grow? Um, how do you feel about home grow? I would love, there was actually a question um, that at a convention that Justin and I um, actually met at and uh, attended, what, almost a month ago now. Um, and there was a question about that. I mean, you know, it, if if it's legal or, or if, Delta, if hemp's illegal or Delta 8's illegal, wherever we're at in the next step, um, why can't, especially veterans or, um, you know, anybody that's able to have access to it, why can't they grow it at their house? It's much cheaper. Um, and, you know, some people like cultivating their own thing. And, and But that's the difficulty is when you have all these different points and, and regulations can't be sure that you're growing a Delta 8 plant or um, you can't be sure that, you know, if it's only legal for some people, then, you know, there's the, op there's the opportunity there for distribution and more, you know, access on it. Um, uh, there were some really, really great points made at that convention, um, such as, you know, people driving to New Mexico, you know, right off the highway to go uh, access um, uh, the, the substances that, that, that they're so choosing. But I mean, you, you have an advocate, you have an advocate in me in progressing this, you know, all the way forward again, home growth. Um, legalization uh, and regulation. And you you brought up several things I was going to start touching on about that convention was people bringing up home grow. And the question that was right before then was talking about somebody that asked Representative Buckley if he was okay with pretty much it being what I call open doctor patient relationship where the doctor says, this is what you need because this is what you have and this is how you will use it at this dose you you you'll use just THC or you'll use just CBD or you'll use these certain ratios and then that question came up about home grow and he he asked a question that I don't think a lot of people quite understood what he was trying to get at and it, he brought like consistency and you you mentioned that a moment ago is like we we need to have regulations in place that where we can make sure we have proper consistency amongst plants mm -hmm. as well as um Something that I think needs to be debunked. I'm pretty sure you'll probably agree with this. People claim, well, the reason why we're not getting home grow is that the cannabis industry itself doesn't want us to have home grow because it would take a chunk out of the dispensary's profit. Mm -hmm. And to me, the reality is that's just not true. And mm -hmm. the, the great example of it is, is who, who here on this call is growing their own tomatoes? Right. I'm, I'm not. Right. But how many people still go and buy tomatoes at the grocery store? because? The time cost benefit for them is buy tomatoes at the store. Yeah, well, I think on that point, I mean, we can we can draw the similarity to alcohol. And pro, the prohibition of alcohol only increased the want and, and interest of of alcohol. And where we're at today, there are people that brew their own alcohol at home, and they go through the proper um, you know checks and balances to uh, produce and sell it themselves. And that doesn't mean that that gives them an opportunity to be on the shelf as well. And more times than not, it's not cheaper. It's actually probably more expensive but um you know it, it there, there are similarities there and, and so you know, i i don't i just as you said i don't think that you know people growing at a house is going to affect large um, marijuana um, or you know uh, cannabis and help uh, growers but the other reality is is you know in in those markets that we have achieved legalization in, in certain states uh, the amount of minority women and veteran owned businesses in that uh, field are so small um, that they're not they're not getting that fair access and opportunity uh, when minority communities have been affected the most um, in this war on uh, marijuana and, and, and drugs in this country. We're going to go into a quick sponsor break here for a moment here at the Lone Star Collective podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode 36. Our guest is Jonathan Hildner for Texas House District 54. I'm joined by co-host Lauren Simpson. We'll be right back after these sponsor messages.
Thrive Apothecary offers an experience truly unique from anything else in Texas, a full-service cannabis solution that is doctor-owned and offers customers every level of cannabis legally available in Texas, from traditional CBD products to emerging hemp-derived THC edibles, smokables, and now medical cannabis. As a licensed medical cannabis provider, prospective patients from anywhere in Texas can book a sponsored online eligibility consultation to determine if they qualify for a medical marijuana prescription from the comfort of their own home. Plus, for Texas veterans, the first prescription appointment is donated by Thrive. Visit ThriveTX.com for more information. Oak Cliff Cultivators is a sponsor of Texas Cannabis Collective and Lone Star Collective Podcast. Oak Cliff focuses on quality assurance with their hemp products while providing customer service to help you discover cannabinoids to meet your needs. Their product line includes hemp flower pre-rolls, CPG tinctures, edibles, Delta 8, and merch. For more information on their products, quality, or to shop online today, visit oakcliffcultivators.com or contact them at info at oakcliffcultivators.com. Austinite Cannabis Company is an Austin, Texas, locally owned and family operated producer and seller of handcrafted cannabis products such as CBD, CBG, CBN, and Delta 8 made from hemp in Austin, Texas. Their selection of products includes beauty products, concentrates, edibles, merch, pet supplies, pre-rolls, tinctures, topicals, and accessories. For more information, visit austinitecannabis.co or you can visit their storefront location at 2009 East Cesar Chavez Street in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast, distributed on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, and much more, to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. Here is this week's host, Jesse Williams and Austin Sam Hariri. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode number 36. Our guest this week is Jonathan Hildner for Texas House District 54. I am joined by co-host Lauren Simpson this week. How's everybody enjoying it so far? It's been a fun time. Yeah, this is fun. I am enjoying this. It's not as nerve wracking as you thought it would be, is it? (laughs) Oh, we'll see. We'll see what the feedback is. <laughs> that chick. They're gonna, they're gonna love you. They're gonna ask for you back. Oh, y'all are sweet. Y'all are very sweet. So uh, while we were at a break, I was doing a little snooping around, and this is a little off topic, right? but um, can you tell me about your documentary that you just done, the ninety one ruse? Is that? Oh, so yeah, no, that. So you were doing a little snooping around, but that I was wasn't. Doing uh, a little snooping around. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually I, I had no part in that. Uh, some good friends of mine um, who are also Colleen ISD graduates, um, most of them, I think three of the four um, filmmakers, put together a documentary about the '91 uh, Colleen Kangaroos. Which I'm Jesse, you know about the story, uh, our state championship. Okay, so I, I don't think I'm sure. I, I know Harker Heights had their own little story, and it's rather right. messy. Right. Long story short, uh, 1991, um, Desert Storm kicked off. So Colleen was a, a ghost town. Um, and we also, unfortunately, uh, were affected by the Luby's cafeteria shooting, which I think before the Vegas shooting a couple years back was the largest shooting um, in the nation. And uh, so it's a story of triumph, um, heartbreak, all of that, uh, where our team was able to uh, win the state championship. Um, after, you know, I think they, th- there was a stat that I think like 60% of the team had either one or two parents deployed as well as the Luby shooting happening, um, mid season. And so phenomenal documentary put together by a young lady named Ashley Redser, uh, and a gentleman named Deontay Epps. And it should be out. I think 91rules.com or .org is, uh, the website that has documents. It's a great story. The Luby shooting, man. I haven't heard anybody talk about the Luby shooting in quite some time. That's. Yeah, I just remember I remember reading they took it offline because I guess of how bad it was. Was 
when the guy ran his truck through the guy, for those who don't know, a guy took his 80 something Ford Ranger, ran right through the front of this restaurant, hopped out with like two pistols. And apparently what he screamed was, this is what Bell County has done to me and started yep. just opening fire on whoever he could point a gun at. And this yep. was the big catalyst that changed gun laws in Texas because a lady had went to testify claiming I had a gun in my car. I take training courses about it. I'm very good shot and I could have easily stopped this, but yet I was limited by what I could do here. And 23, 23 people killed and 27 people injured. And the strange thing was, was even beyond that was apparently this guy didn't really, he wanted to get him with kids involved and that yeah. somebody like apparently had a kid there and he was kind of like, get them out of here. And it was like, mm. that's, that's really odd. It was, it was a very yeah. bad event. It was very strange as how he, he went about doing everything. Yeah. And I believe there's, it, it was place was empty for forever. There's a, there's an Asian food buffet there now, right? About yep, a decade I, or so now. Yeah. I can't remember what it is, but like, great food, but tough to still <laughs> go in that place. It's actually amazing how they're able to kind of rebrand that. Hunan Palace, I think it is. Yeah. yeah it's pretty good. So, we're, we're, what what other things would you say about your campaign? We've talked about the marijuana aspect of things. We we know where you sit at with that. Um, yeah. How would you describe yourself to voters out in District 54, the Bell County area? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we've got a really unique opportunity here um, in in a time where uh, our our country is so divided politically. Um, I think uh, in me, you have a candidate, uh, one not only young. Um, for the good reasons, um, you know, I'm 28 years old. I'm born and raised pretty much in this community. I've gone to school in this community. I've organized in this community. Um, and, you know, we just check so many boxes um, that I think you know, people are looking for uh, today. Uh, we need, uh, you know, non-controversial, um, you know, there, there's so many issues that need to be addressed at the base level. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, too many times, uh, when uh, people get elected, uh, they walk so far on ca on party lines that you're voting for things that do not benefit the community in which you represent. And I think that for us is the most important thing is that, you know, every vote uh, that we'll make in the state legislature is, is for Bell County, um, regardless of, of what the uh, popular thing is nationally. But, you know, again, just to break it down, I mean, you know, uh, we're, we're very focused on, uh, you know, our veterans, of course, our educators, um, our economy and our infrastructure here in this community. Uh, Colleen and, and, and Bell County is such a beautiful place to live. And for too long, um, you know, we've kind of been passed by. Um, and I think a lot of that goes towards um, who has been representing us uh, for years and years and years. I'm not gonna lie, as I tell people, I don't to an extent I don't miss living in that area, and right. it was a lot of just how I felt the area was managed, um, yeah. especially and it's more of a city level thing. Colleen said I lived in Heights, and when I moved to Heights in 2002, it, it was trailer trashville as I called it, and I grew up in a trailer, and I came from a, a poor kid in a trailer to Harker Heights was like, man, this is I'd have moved to ghetto, and now right. and Heights has had this complete 180 even within right. a decade from then. And there's, it's grown and it's become a beautiful town and Colleen hasn't really revitalized. It's downtown very much. They've tried when we talked about right. this at the convention. Um, yeah. Maybe you'll say you want to, you want to touch on that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think just on that point itself, I mean, you know, we, we chose, we have an office in downtown Colleen for that reason. Um, we need positive things to bring people into uh, that part of our community. Um, we also need to be advocating at every level um, for people to come in and invest in our community. Um, there's a stigma that Colleen is uh, dangerous and that, um, you know, uh, you know, just it, it's not a safe place to live. And you look at all of these, you know, uh, message boards and like Facebook and whatever it may be. And when people talk about Colleen, it's not in that beautiful light that I see Colleen as. Um, again, I grew up in this community and, and I've seen uh, the ups and the downs. Um, from all over, I've lived in Arca Heights, um, got friends all over. Colleen is a beautiful community. Um, Colleen needs people that want to invest, not only uh, financially, but you know, you've got to emotionally invest in the community. Um, you know, uh, 
more times than not, I got friends. I, most of my friends live in Washington, D.C. Um, and are continuing working in politics. And they're like, why? Why would you leave D.C.? Um, after the campaign, I had uh, multiple White House job offers and I decided to come home to run for office. Uh, because in all reality, Colleen needs people like myself and, and others that go on and learn um, about how this world works or at least how this country works um, and be able to bring that back to this community. Um, I think, you know, we're taking some great steps on a, on a local level. Um, we're electing uh, great city council members, um, hoping that we'll elect some um, even um, greater school board members to where we can get this community back to um, where it was a shining star. I mean, it's the largest community between um, Dallas and uh, Dallas and Austin and um, population wise. And there's just so much to benefit from here. And, and we've got to we've got to have people that are advocating at every level, not just politically. That was going to be my next question is I'm, I'm sure you get some people push back and say, well, if you want legal marijuana, why don't you just leave? Go to another state. And uh, right. apparently you are kind of like me, because for even other reasons that Texas is doing is consider leaving, right? Like yeah. I'm out and it's just, I'm like, no, you got to stay and fight and change or it's, it's going to get worse. It's, I right. don't think it's better without um, more people staying here and, and fighting and showing up at the Capitol. It's this one thing to be online and, and that kind of stuff, but really all the hard work, exhausting work is during legislative session. I mean, I've never taken such an emotional and physical beating in my life as going to the Capitol and really fighting for some of these people, you know, one more seizure and that could be it. That could be yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's a point I want to make, I guess. No, <laughs> you're, 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 you're totally, you're, you're extremely, you hit it on the head. I mean, you know, you've got to you've got to know that when you come somewhere, you you've got to invest through the ups and the downs. You got to realize that everything that you want, somebody else might not want any of that. And so, how how much harder are you going to work to make sure um, that those things change? Because you know, in my opinion, the reason why uh, we launched this campaign uh, almost eight months ago is because there were more people that were telling me that they needed change than those who were telling me that they were comfortable where they were at. And now, even more. Than ever, um, we're continuing to see more and more things, um, almost on an extreme level, uh, change uh, the protection of women's rights um, and, and, and their bodies. Um, you know, uh, is, is a huge thing. I won't go down that alley because I know we're talking about uh, cannabis, <laughs> but <laughs> there, there are just things that you know everybody needs an advocate, and you know you, you've got to love where you're at. You got to um, you know be passionate about it. It's definitely not easy. Um, it takes a lot out of you and. Um, it's probably why I'm bald at 28 years old, but, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll just, we'll keep going. <laughs> we'll keep going. Something that came to my mind talking about like loving your community and keeping people here and wanting them to stick around. It's made no sense to me that the reason why Texas puts all these incentives in for veterans is they want us to stay, especially the disabled ones. They want us to stay because you're at a hundred percent. You're getting this, this tax free check from the VA. And they want you to spend that money in town. But if you're not giving them options like this, they're like, Lawrence said, they're going, oh, well, if I can't get this here, I'm going to move elsewhere. And they're going, well, we yeah. don't want you to move elsewhere. We don't want you to take that check elsewhere. And it's like, well, then things have to change here. The, yeah. We can't keep doing the same thing. They're become, veterans are becoming medical refugees out of Texas over this. Yeah. I mean, we, we have the conversation about expanding Medicaid. Um, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, Jesse, thank you for your service. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, Veterans, you know, special place in my heart, uh, for sure. But, um, you know, we, we've got to capitalize on what we have. Uh, and as in Bell County, um, don't have the data for it, but I mean, it's clear. Um, so many people that worked with my father um, moved over the years uh, for better jobs in better cities throughout Texas, um, which is a good thing. But they also move out of state. Um, as for my district, we need to create better jobs and employment opportunities for what is probably the largest, excuse me, um, in employment opportunity coming out of Fort Hood. I mean, how many soldiers do we have transitioning out of the military, whether retired or just getting out every single year here in Killeen and Fort Hood? How many of them are we actually retaining? Because we, our top, you know, our top three employment opportunities here are the military, which you can probably uh, put contracting, government contracting outside that. That's not for everybody. Um the hospital systems, and then education. And we don't pay our teachers enough. 
and what the hospitals just went through over the last two years in the pandemic, who would want to work in a hospital environment? So we've got to create more opportunities here economically so that when somebody transitions out, that MOS translates to a job out here that can benefit our community. We'll have more houses uh, bought and lived in, not bought and rented out. Um, and, and we will create that uh, a larger and a much better community, not only in Colleen, but throughout Bell County. Well, as we start to wrap up our last segment and finish the episode 36, Jonathan, is there any final things you want to put out there? Plug your website for everybody. Yeah, no, uh, you know, first, uh, thank you so much for having me, Lauren. Uh, you've done a phenomenal job and, and very glad that you've been the co-host uh, throughout this, uh, this podcast. Um, Jesse, again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, if you want to check out our website, our website is uh, or tx.com. That's H-I-L-D-N-E-R-F-O-R-T-X.com. If you mess up, mess up and put Texas, it's still going to take you there, thankfully. Um, that's our website. Uh, this is the most flippable seat in the state of Texas. There's only one other one that is uh, just as competitive or a little bit more. Um, so, you know, wh wherever you're at, uh, this is a seat on our state legislator, which doesn't only affect our community, my community here in Bell County, but it affects our whole state. Um, you know, my big thing, especially after uh, the news that broke last night, this morning, is vote. Know that, you know, the people that um, you were electing in all of these levels um, have an impact on every right that you have in life. And so, um, you know, please, please go out and vote. Take somebody with you to vote. Vote in municipal elections, vote in state elections, vote in federal elections. They're all so extremely important. So, again, thank you all for having me. And I'll, I'll add to that. The ground game Texas thing is showing just how much local voting matters, changing things in your community, at your level. And that definitely shows the state that people are ready to, they're ready to force that change in other ways if they have to, if they have the force the legislature to try to come around and say, well, you can't do that. It's like, okay, then you, you've yeah. shown your hand this time on where you really stand. We're going to change this. Yeah. And advocate, advocate for what you believe in. Nothing is too big or too small. Um, uh, hold your electeds accountable at every single level. If you vote for somebody that that's almost a, uh, an invitation to, to reach out to them as many times as possible because they uh, we're out here earning your vote. Um, but in all reality, I don't know everything and I don't tend to know everything. Um, and so when we um, are in Austin representing HD 54, we fully expect all of our constituents to continue to advocate in our ears so that we can advocate for them at the best level um, in Austin. Well, that is going to wrap it up for episode 36 of the Lone Star Collective. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This, like I said, episode 36. Our guest was Jonathan Hildner for Texas House District 54. You can find more information at hildner4tx.com as well as txcanico.com for the podcast and other episodes. We thank everybody for showing up this week. We appreciate everybody giving us their time. As always, everybody have a great day, great week, and be safe out there.